Hi everybody, this is Karen Smith, back with some algebra action. Today we're going to talk about radicals. Now I did a video before about exponents and the properties and rules of exponents. So I'm hoping you're watching this right after that. Anyway, it'll be kind of a little bit of a continuation because as you saw in the exponent rules that um, you could go between a radical form of your exponent and an exponential form. So kind of keep that in mind, okay? Radical form. Let's talk about the radical form of an expression. And we're talking about just a single term, one item, right? Okay, radical form will look something like this, okay? You will have, let's see, let me see, hold on. The nth root of a. Okay. What is all this? Okay, so let's talk about the nth root of a. Okay, so the nth root of a, the n is called our index. Okay, this n is called the index. All right, so I'm going to come back and label that. The index, or you may say the root. Okay, and it's actually the index for the root that we're going to take. So if I'm asking you to take the nth root of a, I'm asking you what number can I multiply times itself n times to get a? So what was the base when it would have been in an exponent? Okay, so for example, we would have when you see oops, the cubed root of eight, okay? This is asking you which number is multiplied times itself three times. So the index is the third root, in other words. The cubed root, we say cube for the three. But it's the third root, or the cubed root. And so this would be two, right? Because two cubed would be eight, right? We want it to equal two, excuse me. This is two because what? Because 2 cubed was equal to 8, right? Okay, so next what I'm going to look at will be the a, just the a by itself, okay? So what we call this part, the part under the radical symbol, it's what we're taking the root of, right? This is called our radicand, Right? It's everything under the radical symbol. And speaking of radical symbols, the little house that is over A's head that the index is nestled in is called our radical symbol. It's the square root sign, the, it's, it's the, uh, let's see, yeah, it looks like the division part. It's the purple part here. Okay? Okay. A cool fact, something you'll need to remember very soon, is this. <clears throat> what we have radical form here, and it's something that we talked about in the exponents video. Okay, I said radical form and all. Here, the exponential form equivalent to that radical form would be this. A to the 1 over n power. By the way, when you have a fraction as an exponent, it's called a rational exponent. So you could look that up and, and do a little digging on your own. We'll call them rational exponents because we said that rational numbers are numbers that we could put into a fraction form. Remember, rational numbers, anything that we can put into fraction form, A over B, we, can, we call that a rational number. So we call these rational exponents when you see a fraction in the exponent. It's not a hard thing. It's actually quite simple. And so this a to the 1 over n power is equivalent to what I have written on the left, the nth root of a. So, so what I can do here is put a big equal sign because these two things are equivalent to one another. And you know what? I'll do this for you. You can go in either direction when you're working out your problems. If there's an equation that requires you to handle changing from one form to the other, you can go in either direction. 
Okay, so um, we'll get more into this later. Um, I'll give you one little example here, okay, where you could work with something in, in this way. Let's see, what if I have, what if I have the square root of 100, okay? And I want you to write it in exponential form, okay? So in exponential form, this would be what? 100, and it's a square root, right? When there's no index there, notice there's no n. If there's no index, it's understood to be two, right? A square root. So if we have that, then we would write 10, I mean, excuse me, 100 to the 1 half. So note this. Note that that denominator of the fraction there is your index, right? That's the whatever root we're taking. So the denominator of the fractional exponent is the index or the root that we, are, we wish to take. So we're saying 10, 100 to the 1 half power is going to be the same thing as the square root of 100, which is what, you guys? We should all know that to be 10, right? Let me show you a trick here, okay? We could also write this to simplify it, and this is a skill that will be useful. We know that 100 is what? It's 10 squared, right? Let me make that, put that in parentheses. This was what? 100 in our parentheses. We have 1 half power, okay? So all I've done is I've kind of changed the 100. This is fair. Now raising a power to a power, we know now from our exponent video that we would multiply. So this would be 10 to the what? 2 times 1 half is 2 over 2, or what? 1, right? 10 to the 1. So is this correct? Is the square root of 100 equal to 10? It sure is. So that's good. So you even, you can, you can use your exponent properties, you know, just like you had done in the last video. And so anyway, you could radical form, exponential form, whatever you find easier, actually in reality, you can use whatever you're comfortable with, okay? All right, but we're gonna use radical form mostly, okay? So just keep that in mind. One more thing, let's look at this. What about the cubed root of, Negative 125. What number can I multiply times itself three times to get 125? Let's leave the negative out of it first. That would be five, right? Okay. Now, negative times a negative times a negative. Three negatives multiplied does return a negative. So it would have to be a negative five, correct? So we know what the answer is gonna be. So keep that in mind. But let's go ahead and put it into exponential form and have a look, okay? So it's gonna be negative 125. Remember that the exponent applies to what it's attached to, and this negative is included un in our radicand. So we wanna put parentheses around the, the negative and the number 125. So our exponent will be 1 third. So this says the cubed root of negative 125, okay? So we know what? We know what negative 5 cubed is going to be the negative 125. And if I can multiply that times that 1 third, which is there, right, we'll get our negative 5 answer. Now, if writing this step, these steps in between here is confusing you, don't let it. I mean, really, just you know more than you realize. A little practice will catch you up. Okay. So now I've kind of tied in the exponent rules into this, and you can see how it's, it goes one into the other. So let's move on to some other properties of radicals. Okay, so the first property we're gonna look at tells us that if I'm taking the nth root of a to the n, so if I am taking the index that I'm wanting is this nth root, and the exponent in my radicand match, like when they match like this, we can just extract that A as our answer. Notice when I am able to extract the A out, then I have no more radical symbol, okay? So careful with that, okay? So here's an example of what, what, you know, the, what kind of problem that would be. 
involved with. So let's say um, if I'm asking you for the square root, and I'll keep it simple right now, 25. Okay, so that's the first example, example A. So what I can see in here is that this is the square root of a number squared. Remember this index is 2. It's understood to be a 2, a square root. So the square root of 5 squared. Note that the index, right, which is understood to be a 2, right, it's my little gray 2, matches my exponent. And so see the index and the exponent match. And so we can extract for our answer that 5, the base in the radicand. So this is our answer. Okay, so let's have um, the cube root of y to the 6th power. Okay, now y to the 6th power is 6 is a multiple of 3. So let's kind of keep that in mind. Remember your exponent rules. You can use them to make this a cube. So y to the 6th, can we make that look like this so that our index and our exponent would match. Well sure, what times 3 would be 6? A 2, right? So in other words, if I got my index to match the outside exponent there, whatever's inside the parentheses there will be my answer. So y squared is what I'm going to extract from this cubed root. So my answer would be the y squared. Okay, Okay. so the nth root of the product a times b is equal to the product of the nth root. So the pro, the, excuse me, the, in, let's see, the nth root of a product is equal to the product of the nth root. Yeah, I'm saying that right. Okay, here's the deal. You have to remember that inside here, inside in my radicand you must have a product first of all so make note this must be multiplication under here okay we're talking about factors okay things that are multiplied this applies to multiplied things only I know I said that like three or four times just then but I really want you to remember that okay so here's the deal let's look at an example Okay, so um, let's see if we have this one. Let's have this part A, okay. So the square root of 9x squared. The square root of 9 times x squared, right? Note that this is actually what? The square root of 9 times the square root of x squared. Now, this is a, an intermediate step here. This, this property that we're looking at now actually allows us to do the type of extracting that we're going to do eventually. So knowing this, I have what? Square root of 9 is 3. Then what? Multiplied by the square root of x squared, which is what? x. Okay, so 3x is my answer. Okay, so look at what we started with, 9x squared. As I extract each perfect square, it goes out to the front of the radical sign and multiplies. You may remember that. Let me show you what I mean. Here's another example. Okay, let's take a look at what the square root of 18 and x. Okay. You may be saying that, wait, x is not a square, x is just x. Well, you're right. Guess what? If it's just x, it can't be extracted and it has to stay in the house, right, so to speak. But let's take a look at 18. That It can be broken into, what, 9 times 2, okay? So what is this? This is the square root of 9 times the square root of 2 and I'm going to leave the x under the radical sign with the, x, the 2, excuse me, the 2 with the x. They have to stay inside the radicand because they have no perfect squares, right? That's not 
They're not extractable. They must stay in the radical. But the square root of 9 is extractable. So we can take the square root of 9, okay, which is what? 3. And what you do when this happens is you just tack on what's left over in that radical onto the end of what has been extracted. So this is my answer. 3 square root of 2x is my answer. One more. Okay, let's say we have the nth root of a fraction. Let's have a over b. Okay, so of course we had multiplication. Now let's look at how to handle division. Okay, so here's how this one's going to be. We're going to say, well, we can take the nth root of the numerator, okay, and put it over or divide by the nth root of our denominator or the divisor. Okay, very similar to the multiplication above, right? Just remember this works, this one only works for division, okay? So let's have an example. Okay, I would like to have take the cubed root of x cubed over 8. If this is the case, then I can write this. I can say this is the cubed root over x cubed over the cubed root of 8. Both of these are extractable, right? My index and exponent match for my x, so I can pull the x out. And of course, we know the cubed root of 8 is 2. So we're done here. Every expression has a principal and a minor root. So when you are reading your directions, you're asked to solve an equation, so to speak, then um, you'll have to decide, you know, are they asking me for the principal or are they asking me for the minor? Uh, most of the time in the beginning, it's going to ask you to give the principal or the minor or both. Now, here's what I'm talking about, okay? The principal in general, this is just in general, the principal is going to be the positive root, okay? The positive value. And the minor typically will be the negative, okay? So here's how you go about that, okay? If we're asked, say, to simplify, okay, if the directions read to simplify, this expression, say the square root of 121. If it's simple like that, then I can just say it's 11. In other words, I'm just giving the principal root for this one. Okay, so make note of that. So if I just ask you and we're having a conversation and I say, what's the square root of four? You generally respond with a two, right? So we're not always thinking about the negative 2, but we know that negative 2 times negative 2 is also positive 4. We know that negative 11 times itself will give us the positive 121. So negative 11 is one of the roots. It's the minor root. But typically, when we give the quick answer, we're just given the principal root. Now, when you go to solve an equation, however, x squared plus 4 is equal to 8. So what we want to do is get the x port, the x term by itself, right? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides. Let me get my pen right there, okay? So subtracting 4, these are my properties of equality, saying that if I do something to one side, I have to do it to the other, right? Keeping my scale balanced. So if I take four pounds from one side of the balance scale, I need to take four pounds from the other so I don't go uneven. Anyway, so we're going to do this. We'll cancel our fours on the left in that case. Then we will take four from eight, which is four, right? Let me go back to my other color. Okay, so these guys have canceled on the left, and I have x squared is equal to four. What times itself. What numbers or numbers do I multiply times itself to give me positive 4? Well, we know this to be, we want to, excuse me, we want to say what is the square root of 4, right? Okay, so the square root of x squared and square root of 4. 
by the way let me add this in there between these two steps okay you could add this what I've done to the left side square root of x squared right I have to also do to the right so that's how we're getting from these you know from this step to this next step anyway we're gonna do more of that in a minute okay and so we have what square root of 4 here all right so what should be under there we know we could have what can be four? Let's see. What number squared can equal four? Okay, so that's our question. We could have a negative two, right? That would be true, correct? All right, and then also we could have a positive two squared. Okay, and so that's a little question mark on top of an equal sign. This is also true. Okay, and the reason I'm writing all this out is because technically we haven't gone into the lesson of solving yet. It's coming up shortly, very shortly. So anyway, at any rate, what I'm getting at here is this. My little triangle of circles means finally or in conclusion. That's what that means. X could be plus or minus 2. Here's the deal. I'm trying to give you that plus or minus means I'm giving you the principal and the minor root, okay? So make note the way to give both of those answers at the same time is saying the principal root is the plus on top, plus or minus is what it means. Anyway, and the minor is the bottom, the negative sign. So actually, when you see plus or minus a number, what that is is actually two numbers. It's just a way to make note of two numbers, negative two or positive two. Okay, I'll just put the plus there just to show you that we're trying to denote negative and positive. Okay, that's in generally when you're solving equations, what's going on, okay? All right, let's move on. Okay, so here is a checklist, so to speak, for a simplified radical expression. So in order for you guys to know without a doubt that your radical uh, exercises are fully simplified and ready for submitting the answer or whatnot, this is what needs to happen. Okay, first, all the exponents in the radicand must be less than the index. Okay, so must be less than the index. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, and I'm going to give the directions. We'll read simplify. Okay, so here we go. So example A. So all the uh, in exponents in the radicand must be less than the index. Here's how it goes. Okay, well, the square root of let's say x to the fifth power okay so here my exponent is greater than the index right what is my index right here in this problem the index is actually two okay right because it's a square root okay so kind of remember that let's see my index kind of here index ah sorry is equal to 2 right now as it is written here okay so what I need to do is make sure that the exponent left under the in my radicand in other words is going to be smaller than 2 so it has to be 1 or nothing right so here's how we're going to make that happen okay let's kind of recall once again those exponent properties okay so we can say okay we have x to the fifth so it could be written as x to the fourth times x to the first power. I'm going to go ahead and write the one exponent just because I'm illustrating the skill. Now, you know that if you carried this step backwards, what I just did here, that you are multiplying your x bases, right? Your like bases. We can add the exponents back up. They'd be 5. So you could do that backwards. You can use all any property or rule, the law of whatever. These guys, all these things can be used in either direction, which is quite handy, especially here. Now, 
Earlier we looked at something very similar to this. The square root of x to the fourth power. Let me go ahead and separate them out because we have a rule we just learned that says I could do this. Okay? Now x to the fourth power can be written as what? The square root of what squared? Okay? So this will be a multiplying, right? So x squared squared right raising a power to a power you multiply right so to, in order to just to check you, yourself you can kind of say okay if i was simplifying this i would have to multiply these twos back up to get the four so i'm good right still equivalent in other words so moving forward with the problem though let's go ahead and bring down or bring over that square root of x because that's kind of done there so we're just looking at this first radical symbol here. My index matches this exponent, which means I can extract what's in those parentheses. Okay, so the square root of blank squared is going to be blank, right? In this case, x squared is being squared. So here's what we have. You might want to go ahead and rewind this video and watch this example again. There's a lot of good skills. Each step has something we've learned recently and we've been working on. So this is my final answer. Let me check it. All the exponents in my radicand, that's, where's my radicand? Under the radical symbol, right? All the exponents are definitely less than 2. Okay, let's look at number 2 there. Okay, so we did number 1. Any exponents in the radicand can have no factors in common with the index. Okay, any exponents. Okay, let's look at a, an example that just does that, okay? And that happened in the previous example, but I want to just highlight what we're talking about here, okay? So in B, my example B, all exponents in the radicand can have no factors in common with the index. Check this out. Let's take the cubed root of, um, <clears throat> say, x uh, to the, okay, 6 power. Okay, so where was I? All Any exponents in the radicand can have no factors in common with the index. So this is my exponent that is in the radicand. Let me highlight that. This exponent cannot have a factor, in other words, something in that makes up six, right? Like two and three. So they do. They have a three in common. Okay, so that's not good. We have that means we can simplify it some more. We can use one of our properties to kind of get rid of that situation. So let's see what we can do. Right off the bat, I can say, well, I can make the index of three match since they do have the factor of three in common. I say, well, okay, what times three would give me the six? A 2 right so remember check yourself now if you go in this direction right if you you want to go backwards one step in your mind and kind of check your work right raising a power to a power you have multiply the exponents and 2 times 3 does give me 6 so I can move on now okay so next now you can kind of say okay well now my index of 3 my cubed root matches this 3 right meaning what meaning you can extract the the stuff inside those parentheses there so i can say the square root i mean excuse me the cubed root of blank cubed is blank so x squared comes out and i'm done okay let me go ahead and circle or square my answers so you guys no pun intended on that and there you go. So now, in the end, okay, I don't even have a radicand because it's everything has been extracted. So no problem on number two either. So we're done there. So now, number three in my little checklist. No fractions appear under a radical. Okay, so what's going on there? No fraction under a radical. What they're saying is this. And this is very important. If you, they, they want you to use the rule, okay? Let me kind of give you that rule one more time just to kind of give you a little reminder. Okay, so 
recall. Okay, just a little quick note. This rule. If you have the nth root of A over B, we want you to separate that out and do the nth root of A over the nth root of B. Okay? And the reason is really the number four rule. And I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. So this last example I'm going to do is going to actually cover the last two little items in our checklist. So let me go back up and read the last one. So we don't want fractions to appear under radical. I just showed you what you need for that. And so also really number four is why we don't want fractions under a radical. Okay, we want them separated into two different root symbols, right? Because we don't want any radicals to appear in the denominator of a fraction. Okay, it's kind of like having zero in the denominator, but it's not the same thing. But it's one of, one of those rules that you want to kind of remember because if you leave it like that, it's incorrect. How about that? It's simple. Keep it simple. So let's kind of do this. Okay, so no radicals in the denominator. Let me get that example up for you. Okay, so here we are. We have the square root of 9 over x under a radical. Okay, or it's not, it, it's, it is the square root of 9 over x, excuse me. The radical symbol is the type of problem. Okay, so when we have this fraction under the square root sign, what they want us to do is go ahead and automatically, you can go on autopilot here and separate these guys out. Put one in the numerator, one in the denominator. The square root, okay, of whatever's there. Now we can go ahead and take care of the square root of 9 in this next step. The square root of x has to wait, right? We have to do a little special action on that one. So let's kind of do this. We have 3 over the square root of x. Now, man, okay, what could I multiply times x to make it a perfect square? Well, another x in a perfect world, that's what would happen, right? What I'm about to do is called rationalizing the denominator. Okay, because that rule four up there is not being taken care of, right? We have done our extracting of our squares and we did that and now in the end it looks like we would be done because the square root of x usually would stay as it is, except that in this case it ends up in the denominator. So what we're going to have to do is use the form of 1. I'm sure you all agree with me if I come over here on the side, okay, and I say that if I have a number over itself, say, let's say if I put b over itself, right, b over b is equal to 1. Also, if I take the number 10 and I multiply it times 1, I get a 10 back, right? So I don't change the value of something if I multiply it times 1. Okay? So if I would take, let's say, 10 and multiply it times b over b, I'm still not going to change it, right? It's still going to come out to be a 10 because b over b is 1. Okay, the beauty of all that mess I just made there is this. We can use forms of 1 to do so much in algebra to help us. Actually, most of the time, like when you're getting a common denominator, etc., etc., we're using either something that'll add up to 0 or something that multiplies up to 1. Okay? That's why those identity and those inverse things in the beginning are so important. Okay? Helps us get around in this class. Okay? So what we're going to do here is earlier I said, what can I multiply times x to make it a perfect square? And we said if we had another x under the radical symbol, we would get the job done, right? Well, I would need to put another square root of x, right? Because what I want, I'm going to do this like a wish list. What I'd like to have is a square root of x squared, right? I'd like that to happen. Okay, so... Remember, what you do down here, you must kind of also multiply up top because it needs to be what? This needs to be equal to 1, right? 
All right, so we're multiplying our original problem times 1 to equal something that is going to still be equivalent to the original problem. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we've multiplied straight across to get the square root of x squared. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and carry out the numerator just to kind of bring it over with us, okay? And uh, we're going to have, what, 3 square roots of x. See, that's fine. That You can leave that there just like it is. Let's take care of that denominator now, the square root. Now we can say this, that my index and my exponent match. So now I can extract whatever it is that's being squared. So we have 3 square root of x, right? The, the numerator in the ones like this where you have to rationalize the denominator, the numerators can get kind of messy. They just, they fall wherever they may. You, you just have to kind of keep it organized as best you can. It's that denominator that you want to be able to extract. That's what's so important to get out of that radical symbol. And you have to do it correctly. Okay, anyway, this is the final answer for this one, okay? Now, here's the deal. Let's look at D. I had another example. This will be another one. We're rationalizing the denominator. And it's probably our last little example in this video. So, um, in, in this problem, we have, let's pretend we came from some other steps, and this is where we ended up. Well, lo and behold, we have this radical square root of x again in our denominator. The only problem here is that it is not alone. It is actually attached through subtraction. When this happens, you guys, this binomial, this two-term statement is not so it's not the same as just having a square root x or a single item right remember these are terms not factors when this happens we have to multiply the good news is this is going to be a very similar process for all of these where there's more than one term in your denominator what we're going to do is multiply 3 minus square root of x times its conjugate the conjugate is just the same two terms in the original problem, but it's going to be a different operation, the inverse operation, okay? So here, here's example, okay? Conjugates, and I should put plural, conjugates are this. If I have A plus B, its conjugate is going to be A minus b. It takes two terms and between them it swaps out the operator. So instead of addition it goes to subtraction. That's all. It's pretty much it is that simple. So addition is subtraction and then uh, in the other way, okay, the conjugate. So let me go ahead and put this in a sentence so it's more clear. So the conjugate of 3 minus the square root of x, and I'm going to put this in parentheses to group it together to show you that it's almost, it's like its own number. It is its own number. So the conjugate of this mess here is what? Instead of subtraction between 3 and square root of x, I need to have addition. 3 plus the square root of x. So here is the conjugate. So what we do here is we multiply the conjugates, right? Numerator and denominator, okay? So let me put that in our problem up there. 3 plus the square root of x. Remember, whatever you multiply below, we have to do that up in the numerator to make our form of 1, right? Now don't go backwards and start canceling this out, guys. That's going to defeat the purpose. Go ahead and multiply it out. Okay, then you can start doing the other type of simplifying. So we have to actually kind of complicate before we can simplify on these. So here we go. Let's go ahead and get our numerator out of the way, and we'll focus on that denominator. Okay, so what I've done so far is I've multiplied straight across 1 times 3 plus the square root of x, is just that, 3 plus the square root of x. 
okay and now I want to focus on this denominator where I'm multiplying the conjugate of 3 minus square root of x times it okay so let's take a look at down here at this denominator okay what I'd like to do is take it out of the problem for a minute and so I'm going to like do this and I'm going to do a little scratch work on the side okay so let's rewrite this as though it's its own problem and we'll come back and put this the the result of what I'm about to do afterwards okay so here are my two conjugates in a product form when we have two binomials that get multiplied times one another what do we do do you remember what method that was that we would use we would use the foil method remember that foil tells us what order to multiply the terms okay so that's first outer inner last and you can look up foil method okay so uh, that would help you out if you're not quite understanding what I'm talking about so um, make a note of that okay so here's what we're gonna do first we're going to multiply 3 times 3 right okay so here's how this is let me go ahead and draw the lines so 3 times 3 gets multiplied first to give me 9 second I'm going to multiply the outer terms 3 times positive square root of x okay and it's so it's plus 3 square roots of x okay then the inner terms right okay okay so finally the last two terms okay then that would be what negative square root of x times positive square root of x so what is a negative times a positive that's going to be a negative now that negative signs on the outside that's fine that's good the negative and then square root of x times x which would be x squared okay so um let's go on and simplify this stuff and see what happens okay now we've just multiplied and we have told you a lot of times now that after we multiply or distribute or do something like along these lines we want to combine like terms well let's take a look at the middle two terms here okay these two guys here we have positive th we positive 3 square root of x's and then we have minus 3 square root of x's these two terms end up canceling every time this happens every time when you multiply two conjugates that's actually let me go even further to say this is the point okay the whole point of multiplying something times its conjugate is so that we can have these middle terms cancel and so here we go and so let's go ahead and simplify the last term there minus the square root of x squared so the index and the exponent match right index matches the exponent and we can extract the x so finally I have 9 minus x what's going on now guys look at this no more radical so what happens th the things we're wanting to happen along the way when we multiply a binomial times its conjugate is this okay and let me go ahead and just take that generic version I had with the a plus b okay so we're looking for well, let me go here we want this we want a plus b a minus b I'm going to go back to the problem in a minute okay first we have that a squared in okay outer is minus a b inner is plus a b and last is minus b squared so every time and the reason we even look at this whenever we're in our algebra class is so that we can have the middle two terms in foil when you're foiling okay we want this minus a b and this plus a b to cancel that is the point to doing this for this skill pretty much anytime you need it 
we want to end up with the difference of two squared numbers. Okay, that might sound familiar, and it should. We'll be using this pattern here again in a future chapter in our class. Let's go back to our problem, okay? So what we're doing here is we want to come take that 9 minus x that we ended up with, okay? Right here, we want to take that back to where it belongs, right here in this denominator. So 9 minus x. Transferring it back into the problem. And look here. Can I do anything with this? Okay, 3 plus the square root of x is pretty much done. I cannot do anything with it. And 9 minus x is done. That, that's beautiful. There are no radicals down in the denominator anymore. I'm good, right? No negative exponents. We're looking okay. All those four, the list of four checklist items are good. This is my final answer. So that is the answer. Go ahead and circle it. And we're good. Okay. It's important to note here that you need to stop here, okay? Remember that we have addition, right, between 3 and square root of x, and we have subtraction between 9 and x. Stop there, in other words. You cannot do any reducing on that 3 and that 9. Do not. That would be wrong. Because they are connected to another term by addition and subtraction. Often students will try to reduce that, but it is not reducible. Do not do it. Okay? And um, if you want to talk more about why that is, you guys need to talk to me. If you don't understand why you can't, you cannot reduce that, you need to talk to me and ask me. Okay? So um, that's one for another video. Okay? And I will talk to you guys soon. I hope you all have a great week. And, uh, yep. Yeah, Come see me in the office if you need me. Bye.